Welcome back to another episode of Data Protection Gumbo. And of course, you know me, I am your host, Demetrius Malbro. And today I have a special guest on and super excited about having him on as well. He is Nick Howell, Global Field CTO for Cloud at NetApp. And How you doing, what, Demetrius? Yeah, what, what's your moniker, right? You have a moniker. Uh, it's Data right? Center Dude. Data Center Dude. And if you see his actual background, it looks like he is in a data center right now. There, well. are, there are two racks back there full of gear. Not everything's powered on or you wouldn't be able to hear me right now. But right now, I've just got the networking stack and I think some small NAS consumer NAS stuff. Running. Okay. But if I so fire we, up the servers and the storage systems, it's it gets a little screamy, screamy in here. So we know you don't have some type of SaaS services going on there since you can power things down. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the show. And today we're going to talk a little bit about really what's going on in the market today, right? There's a lot of things that's happening right now. Layoffs are, <laughs> I think I just saw Tesla maybe yeah. laying off 10%. And I mean, it's almost every Mostly week. the Cybertruck division from what I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. Every week there's some layoffs that are happening and it is harder to get a job nowadays, right? So many people are looking and applying. If you look on LinkedIn, you'll see hundreds of applicants on each position, right? There, there's so, so much talent that's out there. And when you look at different titles like technology evangelist or technical evangelist or even like a global CTO or field CTO, that goes to show you that these positions may, at the end of the day, just be big titles, right? So wh what are you seeing just from, from that perspective, Nick? A lot, a lot. And there's a lot to talk about in, to, to be sure to put that in context. There's, I'm seeing the same things you just described. And I make it a point myself to keep, try to keep in touch with folks on LinkedIn to see from recruiters to people that are job hunting to people that are hiring. And yeah. one of the things that I've learned is there is something at play here that could be political in nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try not to go there, but what you have to understand and what I'm hearing from recruiters is that there are these things out there, the way it's being handled is sort of phantom jobs. Mm, okay. There are incentives that companies get in the, by way of unemployment insurance through the state. And there's a mutually beneficial arrangement between large companies, especially, and the states they reside in mm -hmm. when it comes to the state reporting job numbers. So when a company reports, we have X number of recs or job postings, they report that up to the state. The state translates that into creating X number of jobs mm -hmm. that gets rolled up to the federal level, which is why everybody's confused right now. When you hear things like the unemployment is only 3%. Right. Well, not exactly. So okay. that's, I think there's a difference between what we see on the ground happening with our friends, peers, community colleagues versus what the federal government and even state and local governments will report because it's, it's two different metrics at the end of the day. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with the salaries that are actually listed on these jobs? Because I don't remember just a few years ago, like three to five years ago, when LinkedIn posted a position, you typically didn't see like a salary range on there. And I'm thinking that, that that's also some type of local or state wide policy to list the range out of what these positions are. Is, is so there you were know anything several, about that? Yeah, there were several states that passed state level legislation that would require companies to post the range for that this job, this role fell into. California was one of the, and they were mostly yeah. the big tech centers. Mm -hmm. California was one and Colorado was one. So you think about Boulder and Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, et cetera, San Diego, et right. cetera. And there are, the other side of that coin is there are some more sort of modern progressive companies out there that are just being transparent for the sake of it. So there has been this movement to be a little bit more transparent about that. At the same time, you're seeing thing, you're seeing ranges like, 
85 to 250,000. Like, mm. where do you fall in? And depending right. on what your state in, that's going to be different. So there's, while there's been some more transparency in that arena, it's just become more muddied because yeah. you really have no idea where you're going to land in that thing. And it's kind of a sort of finger in the wind based on what state you're in, what level you're at, how you negotiate, all of that kind of stuff comes into play. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I know California, since it is Silicon Valley, always, especially for big tech jobs, mm -hmm. always leads the way as far as regulations are concerned. And they have their own specific regulations when it pertains to employment and also data privacy and, and data protection as well. So that makes a lot of sense. We've seen companies like Tesla, Oracle, even Google to an extent, move mm -hmm. to states like Texas. Right. And Texas does not have that transparency regulation. So you could speculate that there were certain companies that were moving out of California for those, or that was one of many reasons that they might want to move out of California. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know per se. I don't really have any visibility into that. It's more just blind speculation, but it's a kind of an educated hunch that that might be, might have be, be an added benefit to, to yeah. leaving states. I'm, I'm a fan of transparency. I, I've always been transparent to a fault. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, at the end of the day, like I like that we're being more transparent about pay bans in roles. Yeah. I also believe that it's an antiquated way to pay people and, and mm -hmm. value the role that they're doing. So I'm not really a fan of pay bans themselves, but I understand it's kind of a necessary evil to at least get in the door yeah. and get new role, new hires done. So what do you what do you want to be paid in Bitcoin? Since the the price of Bitcoin has what what was it seventy thousand per? I, I can't keep up with it. I think it's back down to sixty something now. Yeah, it goes <laughs> up and down. I I I think my my Coinbase wallet alerts me every day, yeah. and I see it. And Ethereum and several others go up and down five thousand dollar value a, a day. And that's going to be tied to the the monetary value of the US dollar. Like, don't get me started on crypto. It's, yeah, no, it's a big mess. It. There was, I will say as a fun fact, I was mining about 12 years ago. That doesn't surprise me. 12 to 14 what years up. ago, I was really early on that. I literally had my kitchen in my apartment with about 10 old PCs mm. that okay. just had old GPUs in them mining. And I wasn't even doing GPU mining at the time. But there was a point where I had 250 Bitcoin. Ooh, wow. And I sold them for, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 15 to $20 a piece. Now, All today... Right. It's it's going to be one of those things that, that I always just... <gasps> yeah, I thought I was an early adopter, but I realized once those over overnight millionaires were made that I wasn't early enough, right? Yeah. But let's, let's shift and talk about a position and a title that... I just love this title because it has the name evangelist in it, right? Whether it's technology evangelist or technical evangelist or... I don't, I don't know. There's so many different DevOps evangelist, right? What What's your definition of of an evangelist, regardless of what the front part is? I th I think there's been a progression. Okay. I think there's been a you you almost have to timeline this out because before before really, if you go back to about 2007 2008 time frame. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have social media as we know it today. Twitter, I think I joined Twitter in sometime mid-2009. And at the time, it wasn't even the data center dude moniker yet. It was, I think it was that one guy, Nick, was my okay. original Twitter handle. I'll tell the data center dude story in a little bit, um, yeah. how that came to be. But there was a point where a tech evangelist was a role, and it was enough to be a someone who spoke at conferences and someone who went to customers and told the mm -hmm. story of how the portfolio came to be. And at the same time, captured feedback and brought it back into engineering and product management. If you're at a vendor, right. And if you were at a reseller channel partner or somewhere else, then that feedback could also be valuable to the, the account teams and other folks that would run the accounts. And, and I think that was the core of it. I don't think that's changed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the 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 duties and the of the job description of a tech evangelist have have morphed and become single bullet points on several different roles. And I okay. think over the last ten years, we've seen the rise of developer relations and developer advocacy 
right. with the advent around Docker and Kubernetes and the rise of the CNCF and those. So we've certainly seen DevRel become a form of tech evangelist, mm -hmm. but we're starting to see additional elements get tacked on, like the ability to build and nurture communities online right. and in person. Uh, you still need to do the speaking engagements. You still need to do the feedback loops, mm -hmm. in, internal and external. Those haven't really changed. It's still the core functionality, fundamentals of a of a tech evangelist. But we see branches of it splitting yeah. off. Same things happening with cloud and cloud native. Mm. And we see certain similar things. The tech evangelist itself has gone from what it was in the beginning to kind of what I inhabit today, which is more, we see field CTO get used yeah. more and more often. And that's where, that's where I've really landed. That's kind of the sweet spot that I've been in for about the last five years, I don't know, longer than that, seven mm -hmm. years, I'd say. Yeah. So that's, it's more of an evolution. It's not anything super groundbreaking. It, it continues to be a, a little bit more forward thinking, a little bit more visionary. But right. the similarities you see between them are more same than different. Being good speakers, being being able to tell a story with customers. Yeah. There's a content piece too. Yes, that comes. I I don't want to qualify being able to do the job and say that you have to blog, you have to have mm -hmm. a podcast, you have to have a live stream, you have to be active on so right. I think the other thing that's come into play recently is this whole content creator ecosystem and influencing. Yeah, that's huge. So there's there's an element now there's this expectation that if you're doing DevRel or if you're doing evangelism work, you have to be a content creator. Right. And yeah. I I think that's just the nature of the beast of the internet. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's really tied to a role. I think it's kind of indirectly becoming an expectation. So I always tell people, make content for your employer, but also make sure that you're doing it either as your brand, your personal brand, or make sure you're doing other content in addition to something that's not tied to your employer. Right. And for right. example, if you go look at the Data Center Dude YouTube channel that I've been running for a few years now, mm -hmm. you'll find some NetApp content on there, but the vast majority of it is going to be content that's kind of near and dear to me or right. that I think people will talk about. Or, or we'll yeah enjoy. yeah and I, I've seen a content piece I love the way you describe kind of the evolution of the role just based on where we're sitting today and especially what I see I see now that as part of the job responsibilities and duties are yeah you have to be able to create content whether it's writing blogs or white papers or whatever the case may be that if they need you to kind of jump in and help out with some go to market stuff then you better be able to do it but I know the role is is really a different role and I know the first evangelist if I'm not mistaken was a guy Kiyosaki he's attributed Kiyosaki. with being the first tech event right. titled tech evangelist yes yes he's over at Canva now I think he's the oh really yeah yeah he's at Canva nice so yeah he's uh, I, I followed him and I bought his book it's like an older older book around evangelism or whatever, but it's a pretty cool, pretty cool book. Now you mentioned Phil CTO. Yes, sir. What, what, what does that mean? Is that, is that someone who's out and out and about having conversations with customers and you never sit in your office, you're always on the go talking to customers, demoing or EBCs or at a conference or, you know, at a dinner somewhere, right? Rubbing elbows with some of the top execs. I, there are people that describe it the way that you do. Mm -hmm. I think of it a little bit more nuanced and layered. Okay. So large companies are going to have layers of interaction with customers. They're going to have their, their dedicated account team. Their, mm -hmm. their first line of, of, of call is going to be to their account exec or their, their SE, their systems engineer Okay. or sales engineer, <coughs> excuse me. And then normally regionally, Above and beyond that, you have an extra layer of kind of a super SE that will cover multiple accounts, but be a maybe a higher level portfolio viewpoint that can come in and and assist the account team locally with that customer mm -hmm. to to help with that stuff. I see that commonly across what no matter what company that you're at. 
those are day to day kind of roles. They, they're, they don't necessarily have to be veterans. They don't have to have a complete purview of everything everywhere within the company and the status of all of the products and the roadmaps of everything. Like you're going to have a pretty good idea of that kind of stuff at a high level as one of those layers. But at a certain point, you're going to need to call a product manager. You're going to need to call an engineer to come in to answer the super deep divey questions that are going to come in. The difference between that stuff and what I consider field CTO level work, take everything we talked about with technology evangelists, take okay. everything we talked about with content creation and influencing and building that personal brand around it. Mm -hmm. But then I also want you to tack on living five years in the future. Okay. Everything that I look at from a net app perspective has a bent of where's this going to be in five years? Where's the gap that we're not looking at or that we're not thinking about? I'll throw a NetApp thing in here just as a purely as yeah, an example, go ahead. right? Six, seven years ago, 2017, people called us crazy for betting so big on cloud. That's because if I take my timeline all the way back to 2012, I was taking our operating system and trying to shoehorn it into an EC2 instance okay. in AWS mm -hmm. as far back as 12 years ago, right? Okay. And that is some of the kind of R&D you know, screw it, let's see if this will work, who knows, kind of stuff that that we would do as an experimental side of things. Mm -hmm. In 2014, we, we launched Cloud on Tap, which was the what we know today as Cloud Volumes on Tap. But we decided, let's take it one step further and let's build the relationships. And nobody else was doing that. And in fact, there were a ton of haters out there saying, that's <laughs> crazy. Why are you foregoing all your hardware business to do all of this? The right. fun fact is we didn't. But people like to make the press headlines. But that's the it. stuff I'm talking about. Like living that far out in the future, forgetting, forsaking everything that you know that's going on in the industry today, or at least knowing where it is and thinking that far ahead is is part of that as well. So you kind of okay. have to be a little bit of a free thinker, a little bit of a creative and a little bit of a crazy visionary in a way to just think up stuff like, hey, you know what would be, be cool? If we could actually stand up our on tap in a managed service in AWS, like who would have ever thought to do that? And and we partnered with AWS and we launched it a couple of years ago. So yeah. that's the that's the kind of stuff that I would throw in there. If you're not doing that kind of stuff, I mean that is CTO level work. And whenever I see somebody that is basically just a super SE, that kind of regional overlay or even a global overlay that isn't doing that kind of stuff, I think, they've, yeah. I think they've assigned themselves the wrong title. So someone who's truly partnering with the product management and the engineering side of the house, helping to innovate and getting their hands dirty with a uh, lab system and you yeah. have the latest bits of a beta of an alpha system, right? And you're, you're helping to steer the company into a future direction of where you see the actual future of technology going well for it to get to an alpha beta it has to be productized or right. at least a skunks works project has to be stood up in some way for it to, so i mean i'm i'm past that like mm -hmm. if it's already productized somebody's got their hands on it and they're dealing with it i might pop in to give some feedback every yeah. now and then but it's where i'm out beyond that you beyond that okay and i'm not saying it's beneath me but i'm saying like i want to participate in that stuff because i'm a passionate super geek like I love storage. I love infrastructure. I love cloud. I love all mm -hmm, of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? I am just a geek at heart. So yeah. I get excited. My problem is, is I end up with too many plates spinning and it becomes unmanageable to a certain extent. Yeah. So the, as I've gotten older and as I've gotten wiser, it's, it's more about saying no and doing a bit of a time management, time management prioritization game as to, you know, what's important right now for me to work on. And for the last few years, it's really been about messaging. It's been about getting mm -hmm. this, the, whether it's the cloud message or over the last 12 months, we've launched new systems. We've had, so I really haven't talked about cloud that much for the last year. It's yeah. whatever the day calls for or whatever the period calls for. And you really just have to be able to pivot on the fly as yeah. soon as you possibly can and be willing and able to do that kind of stuff because the inertia of doing that at a big company can be massive, 
So for the company to have people, I jokingly refer to gunslingers, right? For Mm -hmm. somebody to have a go-to person that can get something out there quickly, whether it's a LinkedIn post or an article, whether it's a YouTube video they can turn around in a few days, whether it's guesting on a podcast Mm -hmm. uh, or hosting a live stream with particular individuals to talk about it, like that's the kind of stuff that I've been able to turn around. Fortunately, I've had the the senior management that allows me to do that kind of stuff right. and yeah. the freedom to be creative in that way and experiment. Mm-hmm. But that's a big part of it. Okay. So above and beyond the what I'll refer to as the day job of it all, you have to have enough passion and want and things like that to arm yourself with the creative elements of all of this too. Yeah. And one final question here, Nick. Okay. You mentioned the future. So five years from now, so gener- generative AI, artificial intelligence is the the hoopla right now. NVIDIA has been crushing it and breaking records. You see all these partnerships. You see all these acquisitions and mergers, especially in the backup and recovery market where I primarily sit. What, what are you seeing? Like, where are we? Give us one thing that you can share. Not Not some of the Nick data center dude secret sauce, but something that you could share that you think will be revolutionary or where we will all be as far as positions or titles or how we're going to work in the future. Yeah. No, that's a tough one. I know it's a tough one. Well, can I ask you a, a, a kind of a positioning question real quick? Yeah. How often do you find yourself using chat GPT on a day-to-day basis? Honestly, like are, are you pulling it up it, every day and doing stuff? Yeah. With it? Yeah, I am. Yeah. As far as email, Anytime I have to write an email or something like that, I'll go, hey, chat GPT, can you write me a reply on this or that? Just so I can get a kind of template, right? So today and for the past, I don't know, 20 years, we have really leaned on Microsoft Office, Outlook, PowerPoint, Mm -hmm. Excel, Word documents, right? Or Google Docs. I'll I'll throw that, qualify that in there as well. What is the first thing that has been implemented by Microsoft and Google? The first thing Mm -hmm. they threw their AI platforms into were their productivity suites. Yeah. So you don't have, you know, there's there's the alliance between OpenAI and Microsoft that has made that easier with bringing Copilot to to bear, to market. Right. And we've seen Google with Gemini. They've got, they're going to be tying it to the search engines and the, their file system platforms uh, for indexing and all of their productivity suite as well. Right. So any what I'm seeing, LinkedIn, LinkedIn mm-hmm. has AI yeah, now, right? They do. So yeah. what I'm seeing is there is companies are adopting AI more than they're not. Right. And I'm seeing this across the board. I haven't really seen this too much in the private enterprise sector just yet, but it's coming. And I think what people don't realize, we used to lean on Power BI from Microsoft and th- tools like that Dynamics 365 and things mm-hmm. like that to mm-hmm. to give businesses intelligence or to turn their raw data into information they could use to make corporate decisions and planning and things like that. I think that's going to become unnecessary. I think all mm. of the the some of this generative AI work or even just the inferencing basics is going to okay. be make that a non-issue anymore. You're going to be able to interact with your data with a chat prompt or even a Mm -hmm. voice prompt. So you could say, Jarvis, what are our projections for the next 12? This could be the best thing ever for a CFO. Right. Or a controller or someone like that Mm -hmm. that's doing finance with raw numbers and and stuff like that, like actual real data. I, I think that it's going to impact the things that depend on raw data the most. I don't know that it's going to completely replace the creatives. I think the okay. creatives are going to be more aligned with using a prompt engineering prompt. In, you know, you've, I've heard it. I've always thought it would be info engineering. Mm-hmm. Data science scientists sort of took over. Yeah. Yeah. I was always referring to that 10 years ago as like info engineering. That's what I thought it would evolve into. Now right. that I'm seeing the generative AI and AGI and things like that come on board, I'm really looking at things like, RPA, robotic process automation, the level of IoT sensors and things like that that are just Mm -hmm. generating data that then can be manipulated to reprogram those IoT sensors. And your Roomba could become an actual biped robot vacuuming your floor instead of a little disc, you know, flying around your house. 
<laughs> like the Jets. Yeah. I, I do think within the next five, I, th- I think by 2030, we'll see the first autonomous assistants really start to, to roll out. Tesla's already, they've put out Optimus, I think is what they've named theirs. Mm, okay. And that's walking around. Amazon has autonomous robots basically running warehouses oh, yeah. now. Right. Yeah. And I, I look at that as I, to, to sum it all up, I, I hate to use the old iceberg analogy, mm-hmm. but I think what we're seeing right now is literally the tip of the iceberg. We have maybe the sliver of a fingernail of what's going to be possible. I, I just don't think we have the computing horsepower right now to really do what we will be able to do in 10 years. Yeah. I, I love all of that. And one thing that we didn't cover, you mentioned IoT and some of RPA, et cetera. One thing that we didn't talk about, which we don't really have time to get into, is just how will you secure all of that? So from the cybersecurity perspective, because each one of those things introduces an, an attack vector. And I just saw something with Roku around <laughs> some type of breach and I mean, headlines are just riddled with with breaches as well. And so it's becoming a really, really, really big deal in order to lock things down and also be able to recover um, as well, because it's going to happen one day. Your data is going to to get out there. All of our data is in some shape, form or fashion is already out on the dark web anyway, because we, we're all consumers. So it's it's something we can't run from. But. We've all been to a Target at some point. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> that our info and credit card. So uh, there's multiple use cases of that. Right. How do we secure oh. it? Yeah. How do we secure it? Uh, I'll throw it back. I did a contract job for a very large financial institution in 2003. And I'll never forget what one of the CCIEs on the job told me. He says, the only way to be truly secure is to not connect or to build your own. If, if you're connecting systems to the public internet, they are at risk. Period. Hard right. stop. At all times... At, through any vector, you can firewall as much as you want to. You can mm-hmm. anonymize as much as you want to. They are always going to be at risk. Today, I saw something come out about there's a new Bugzilla from Red Hat about Putty and WinSCP. So something yeah, that's software. 30 years old, right? Yep. So everybody, for the first time in years, everybody's scrambling to update Putty. You know, some some a simple terminal system that we use to connect to system. Guys, if it's on the internet, it's vulnerable. Yeah. So either don't connect it or make sure that you build your own sort of inter- private network that can right. be completely shielded from it. And that's really the only case. As far as IoT, the risk there is, you know, we, we all stand up a bunch of IoT stuff in our houses. Companies put them, manufacturing facilities have IoT sensors on assembly lines that determine speed and right. error mm-hmm. rates and things like that, temperatures. How how much does the aircon need to run? All of that kind of stuff. Mm. I think there's an element of that where it can be vulnerable, but it can also be protected and that data can only be captured in-house. I don't know that we have much control over that as consumers. Yeah. I certainly have choice when it comes to using things like home Apple HomeKit that's encrypted versus something that's not. Mm-hmm. And that's the direction I've gone personally is everything that's in my house is HomeKit. Yeah. And manage that way. And that, but that requires special chips and all kinds of stuff. So and I don't knowledge. know that there's a silver bullet there, Demetrius, as far as security. And I don't, I don't think we've seen the worst of the cybersecurity stuff either. Right. Because as our computing systems get stronger, so do theirs. Yeah. Yeah. And the attack vectors increase, the speed at which they're able to encrypt stuff increases, all of that stuff when it comes down to it. It really comes down to fundamentals of managing infrastructure, have your backups. Make sure you have an immutable copy. Mm-hmm. Make sure they're often enough. Make sure you can communicate your RPOs with senior leadership and the board. Make sure all of that is documented. Make sure you have a so-and-so gets hit by a bus run book <laughs> yeah. of everything that needs to go down the minute your systems get completely compromised. Like, yeah. Have all of that stuff. Spend the time, spend the money to have all of that stuff done because it's, it's not if, it's when yeah. for most companies. And you have to practice all of that stuff too, right? So when when it goes down, when something hits, you have to be well rehearsed in that because the stress levels will be really high um, once it happens. And you're going to be scrambling. Like you might need legal and you might need a CFO and your CEO and everyone standing by to help 
initiate that particular portion of the plan because you got all these compliance and regulations and reportings and now you have to fill out 8Ks that there's been a breach. Nobody wants to send those in. <laughs> Is it material? Is it not material? And I mean, it's... There's, well, it's I'll a say, lot. as a data protection podcast, I'll, I'll throw one, one little feather in here. I, I think that NetApp has arguably one of the more, one of the best arguably unknown things that we do now, and it's our autonomous ransomware protection. No mm -hmm. company out there can whole, wholly prevent your data from getting encrypted. Right. Nobody. The best we can do is react to something as quickly as possible. And what we've built at, at NetApp is sort of an ML behavioral mechanism that mm -hmm. is tied to each of your volumes in the storage system. And it learns behavior of data, last data accessed. Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it frequently used? And we'll learn behaviors of where is the data being accessed from? Who will map all yeah. of that? Mm -hmm. The minute we see something come that is outside of that behavioral model, we take a snapshot just in case. Costs you nothing. Costs you 150 megabytes for that snapshot. Yeah. Just in case. And what we found is we can be 90, up, 95 plus percent, upwards of 98, 99% effective in that. So you basically restore the snapshot back to where it was mm -hmm. and you've got 90 plus percent of the data of that volume. And then you might have to go back and pull the other five to 10% from tape at worst mm -hmm. or a immutable snapshot in a, in a different location. But we have companies back up in a day, if not less, nice. sometimes an hour. And I, that is, that is the kind of stuff we can only improve upon that from a Delta standpoint of like how, far, but it's never going, I don't know that there's ever going to be something as proactive as we'd all like to have mm -hmm. because we never know 400% sure. And it's almost impossible to know just being logical here. There's, it's almost impossible to know whether something is an attack or not at the interface level until it starts manipulating data. There's really no way to know other than the blacklists that are out there. And we, obviously we, we block all of that, that kind of stuff natively within the yeah. system. That's a given for just about anybody out there, but for some companies, that's kind of all they do and there's no ongoing monitoring. So I, that's one of the big, big things that I see that we've got, we've had a win with, but again, that's something five years ago that was crazy to think about. But mm -hmm. it's now yeah. it's reality. Where are we going to get from five years from now is is kind of the stuff that excites me. And I think AI is going to have a big part of that yeah, when it comes definitely. to yeah. those kinds of things. I think mm -hmm. all of we're going to see some level of GPU in them in the future for AI to yeah. process information and interact with yeah, whatever that box mm -hmm. is doing. Right. Yeah. Or cloud uh, processing instance, power example. is going to move closer to the uh, device. Yeah. That's the that's some of the stuff that I spend a lot of time looking at is DPUs, APUs composable architecture infrastructure mm -hmm. and things like that now outside of cpus i wrote an article recently on linkedin you guys might want to check out talking about how ai could be signaling the end of x86 as a platform as mm -hmm. as a whole like we, it's been the stable thing for 40 years now mm -hmm. i are we in the are we in late stage x86 era wow. um is okay. ai and all of its use of dpus gpus tpus going to maybe force us more into an SOC and ARM kind of world? Hmm, interesting. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know that we can do... We're, we're at a race to the bottom at the die size of x86. Mm -hmm. uh, Intel and AMD have been on that race now for a decade. Or yeah, more. they have. And we're now down to the 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer... And I hear 3 nanometer processes are coming soon. But... There's not much further we can, there's not much smaller we can make <laughs> transistors, right? <laughs> we, we, we're, we're stacking billions of them on a three nanometer process. That is, there's not much more we can do there. So we're going to be looking at external composable infrastructure for some of these more demanding workloads. And, and Demetrius, we didn't have a time to talk about what's going on with quantum. Like that's a whole other hour conversation. Yeah, maybe the next episode. It, it's going to be <laughs> we a big talk one. about that. But yeah, I, I appreciate all the insight. I mean, we could keep going here and touch on so many more topics. And I really love the way you framed everything. Uh, I would love to have you back of so course. we can continue this too. conversation as well. Data Center Dude and Data Protection Gumbo. Uh, I hope everyone has an opportunity as well 
before we wrap up to go check out and join the Backup and Recovery Professionals LinkedIn group. There is about 26,000 of us there, and we're having conversations similar to the ones that we're having right here on Data Protection Gumbo. So, Nick, once again, thank you for being a guest on today's show, Data Protection Gumbo. Demetrius, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it.